Hey, Midgardians, I'm Clay. And I'm Joe. Welcome to that Midgard show. This is a podcast where we talk about the Midgard campaign setting published by our friends at Cobalt Press. In this episode, we're going to talk about Zobek's Temple District and the outline areas. Yeah, we're anxious to move on to other areas of Midgard. So we're going to do this one and close things off with another episode on Zobek's gangs. At some point, we will come back to Zobek with a special guest to talk about how Zobek evolved over the various editions and many of Zobek's Ionic characters. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah, and just so we can get uh, through uh, the episodes quicker, we're going to pause on the Adventures Recap and Creature Showcase uh, just so we can uh, give more room uh, in the show to uh, wrap up Zobek. The Temple District is so named for the many temples it contains. Lada's largest temple stands here along with important temples to the other major gods of the Crossroads region. We're talking Rava, which is, you know, Numero Uno in, in Zobek. Uh, there's Volund, Perun, uh, Porvet, and Yarilla. And there's also a bunch of shrines to various saints that uh, are all across Zobek itself. The temples of the district are open from dawn to dusk. After nightfall, only priests and the most devoted followers travel through its streets. Yeah, there's quite a few temples here on the crossroads, not temples to every god, right? And I, I think at some point, maybe we need to do an entire episode on just gods of, of Midgard in general, because there's a lot. But there's certain ones that are, are definitely prominent in the crossroads region. And those are the ones we're going to see temples to uh, in the temple district. Now, you know, we had previously talked about um, one of Lada's temples over in the Collegium, and there is another one here in the temple district. But the first one I really wanted to mention, though, was the Church of Perun. And it's it's kind of a neat one uh, in that it's very maybe ordinary. It's this large stone building with virtually no outer embellishments. Uh, it might be unrecognizable at all, but it has these thunderstone symbols over its doors. But a lot of people just mistake it for like a warrior's guild. But uh, inside, there's a small shrine, but the majority of the building really is just houses and armory and rooms dedicated to martial training. Behind the building, there's like a courtyard and uh, that's used for weapon practice. The clerics basically spend most of their time here training uh, citizens in basic combat. And those willing to offer themselves to prune receive a spear and a dagger or a pike and a short sword. So that they generally get these two weapons kind of gifted to them as part of their, their service to the god. And there's an understanding that uh, they'll answer the priest's call to arms if needed. So the church of Perun really serves as like an unofficial recruiter. So it, it's a very militant organization, Perun's a, a war god. I would think if you're like a, a cleric of Perun, you're probably doing like war domain or something along those lines. It's, it's very combat oriented. Uh, so a lot of training and stuff like that goes on there. Players are either clerics of Perun or, or you know, uh, War Domain. They'll probably want to visit this place at some point. Not a lot of other information on it, though, other than that. So you'll have to kind of use it how you see fit. For me, one that I actually end up using a bit is is the other temple of uh, Lada here. So it's called the Temple of Golden Lada. So this one, uh, unlike the one in, in the Collegium District, uh, actually is a larger one. This is her what you probably call the, the main temple. This one is tall. It has this elaborate edifice, a pink stone. It sits on a small hill and its tallest tower peaks above the city walls to better see the first glint of dawn. So as with a lot of more popular celestial dawn temple in the Collegium that we talked about, petitioners line up before dawn to receive, you know, priests healing and blessings and stuff like that. So again, no citizen is denying that healing. And they can, you know, go there to receive whatever they might need. Inside the temple, the statues, pillars, pews, all kind of radiate this, like, golden sheen. It's calming and supplicants seeking a lot of blessings will go there. No one is denied healing, like I said, at least during the daylight hours. Though uh, any receiving, like, a powerful curative magic, like something, re like, you know, if you're to get like a, you know, uh, resurrected or something crazy like that, you're going to have to serve the temple for a period or perform some great tasks to kind of repay the debt. The head priestess, the, you know, the, the main person of the order, her name is, uh, I think we mentioned this last time too, but Luca Angeli. And uh, she is this small woman with dark hair, but very kind of powerful personality. 
She keeps uh, rooms actually in both temples, so she kind of bounces back and forth between so that she can kind of give attention to the lesser priest and the, you know, the people who visit there kind of equally. Though I definitely think that there's a preference to the temple in the Collegium District for some reason. Even though this is the main one, I've always kind of seen it as the one in the Collegium District is a more favored temple by her and a lot of the people. Uh, it's just like a prettier temple or there's something about it. I, I remember reading something about it at one point. So that's kind of the way I, I've at least portrayed it in my games. So again, Lada is a healing goddess. I think her main domains are going to be healing and light uh, are probably the two main domains. So if you have a cleric that is looking for, or a player that's looking to be a cleric of those domains, Lada is your goddess for that. So have you used either of these temples in your games? Uh, Perun. Perun was where uh, PCs uh, went to get uh, weapons repaired or to uh, replace lost oh, okay. weapons. Yeah. And, uh, so they and actually had I, forges and stuff there? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, they, they kind of exchanged uh, what they had for, <laughs> for what they had in their okay. armory. Uh, there, there were uh, clerics there who could do some minor repairs. I also uh, used the the Church of Perun as a as a downtime location. One of my characters uh, wanted to uh, train for a certain feat, and uh, so I sent them there, you know, during our downtime uh, to train there. Okay, yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah, I like that idea for downtime for training. I could totally see that, and then maybe having to exchange for some kind of service to the temple. Yeah, yeah. Now, a temple that I use uh, frequently, uh, you know, particularly for my character uh, Eggy is the Temple of Yorilla and Porvit. It's an open series of plant intertwined columns serve as a temple to the green gods. And Eggy calls them Mary Jane. Eggy's a, 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 circle, a circle of the dr green druid. He uh, searches <laughs> for rare plants uh, that have uh, medicinal qualities. So it's no surprise that uh, Eggy would find comfort in uh, such a god. And he, he never yeah. says Yorilla and Porvet. You know, the, the, the other PCs are correct him all the time. He goes, yeah, man, Mary Jane. The PCs is like, no, no, Yorilla and Porvet. Right, right, Mary Jane. But just kind of have that <laughs> circular, uh, annoying uh, discussion where, you know, Eggy will not give ground. Yorilla and Porvet are Mary Jane. Eggy is very Tommy Chong, isn't he? Yeah, he's 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 Tommy Chong for sure. I modeled uh, Eggy <laughs> after him. Also, the character Chong from uh, the Avatar series, the uh, Legend of Korra, and yep. so you know that character yep. Chong was kind of based on Tommy Chong. So I just used them both. You know, happy go lucky, uh, perfect. You know, fun guy. So at this temple, many herbs and plants, usually only found in Margrave, grow here. Spellcasters often make donations to the temple for allowances to take cuttings from the plants as spell components, but uh, clerics won't sell them directly. Ogolai Kiat, who's an elderly centaur from the Eastern Plains, is the temple's current high priest, and he leads the opening of the spring festival's rite. So either he's the guy who, who, who will sell, or they just have some middleman that works at the uh, temple. The temple will earn, you know, incremental revenue from the uh, sale of the cultivations of their plants. So they can say, no, we didn't sell anything, but it was, uh, you know, sanctioned by a character you create uh, to do that. Sourcing of, of rare ingredients. And Margrave, you know, we've, we've talked about uh, it many times, and, you know, that's going to be a subject of, probably a, another series of episodes. There is a lot of rare plants that only grow in the Margrave. Uh, this temple uh, found a way to cultivate them here locally. So uh, folks didn't have to uh, risk their lives heading into the Margrave uh, to get uh, uh, certain plants for, you know, spell components or healing and uh, so forth. So a uh, really cool place, yeah. very, very in line with with one of my characters and and it's just for me as a player i really get to play up that trope that tommy chong trope and uh, use uh, uh this temple as uh just another tool in eggy's toolbox i i maybe it's because of my my roots with dragonlance and and race limit but 
when I play a wizard, I like to, I never take a spell focus. I always go with the spell, with the component pouches. And I'm always like, I need to go buy more components. Like it's, it's a hand wave in 5e, but for me, I'm like, I, I like that part of it. I like role playing the finding of the components and the herbs and stuff like that. So like, if I'm playing a wizard, I totally want to go here and like restock on spell components and things like that, you know? And like you said, like, they don't sell it directly. It's like, you have to leave a donation, and then they will donate some herbs to you. It's like, give a penny, take an herb. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I just, I, I like, I, I, know, I like this place is because that's the kind of wizard I like to play is I, I want my spell components. I like, I like the idea of the smells of, you know, the, the different types of leaves and, you know, all those different plants and the guano and all that stuff, you know, and I picture my, my wizard with all these pouches and stuff carrying that stuff. So yeah, I'm totally going to this place to, to stock up on things like that. So yeah, I love and it. it. And that's a type of role playing that you can do to kind of extend your character a little bit rather than say, I cast such yeah. and such. You know, you can you can really kind of describe. I I, I start to uh, scrunch up some some leaves of a particular flower mm -hmm. and slap it on my forehead, and and then I you know yeah. start to make you know my semantic component um, hand gestures you know along with uh, the incantation. A yeah. raging fire comes out of my hands. You know. Just a, yeah. a way to kind of back in AD and D second there. edition, you had to track all that, man. Like I remember back playing AD and D, we had to keep track of that stuff. So I guess it's just a remnant of those days. I enjoy that aspect of the game. I enjoy role playing that. I enjoy describing my character using components, and I I don't mind like if my DM's like, oh yeah, well that's going to cost you this much gold to buy those components. I'm like, cool, that that's okay with me. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's part of the game, so I enjoy it. Yeah, and if you like The Witcher for. Uh... You know, the main character fights, you know, he's consuming some sort of potion to help uh, buff yeah. him up during during combat, you know. So so it's it's something I do when I play NPCs that are spellcasters. I always make sure to describe what they're doing to cast the spell, particularly if it utilizes a, a component. The players enjoy it. It's just a little more than, um, you know, I cast Bless or something. So the next uh, big temple in the in the district is the Temple of Rava. Now, this is a metallic structure with brass bound iron doors and a green copper roof. And this temple stands out. Two steam golems guard its entrance to protect the valuable works that take place within. This church is the birthplace of the Gear Forge. Now, the main temple level includes three important shrines. There's the Shrine of Trade, where balances are trued and weights and measures blessed, the Shrine of Fate and Foresight, which includes the sacred and private territory of the Clockwork Oracle, and the open hall of the Patroness, where the arts and industry of the city are featured alongside minor paintings of Zobek, its founding and history. This last one is where public services are held, such as contract signings, marriages, priestly investments, and funerals. Now, there are crypts in this temple, but you'll be surprised that it's not for burials, but for births. The lower halls contain a series of workshops and assembly rooms. In the Sanctuary of Gears, that's where you can find the clerics performing the binding rituals to seal humanoid souls into the metal bodies and create the children of Rava. Oddly, Firedrake, also the high priest of Volan, serves as the Dwarven High Priest of Rava, and Lena Ravovic serves as the High Priestess for the humans. This is the only temple where Gearforge number among the priesthood. Now you must be wondering, yeah. how can a cleric be devoted to two gods? That's something that you can't find in the core rules. But if you look in the Hero's Handbook, there is a section to describe a uh, polytheist uh, clerics that uh, has mechanics that allows your cleric to devote themselves to more than one god. So that's why Odli is a, uh, a priest of Rava and a priest of Voland. And it's a really cool trope. I've, I haven't played a polytheist cleric yet. One of these days I will. It's a, a very unique to Cobalt Press, but uh, having the, the mechanics to play a polytheist cleric is one of those things that... Uh, you know, drew me to uh, 
to Midgard. You know, it's almost like they're breaking the rules. You can't be a priest of more than one god. Right. Still one domain, right? I mean, it would still only be one domain mechanic. If we're going to talk like 5e mechanics, it'd still be a single domain, but he's devoted to multiple gods. And yeah. It's kind, of, it's kind of a neat thing. It's also kind of neat that in Temple of Rava, right, we'd have two high priests, one for the dwarves and one for the humans. And, you know, I, they don't really go into much detail on that. I'd have to maybe look into the section on Rava uh, herself and see if there is more information about why they have uh, two high priests, but they do. They have a, high, a dwarven high priest and a human high priest. But I think more interesting, right, the, the real takeaway from this is that all this industry, all these things coming into uh, Zobek, a lot of which is to help create the gear forge. We talked about how in the gear district, we see different gears and materials and stuff coming from the iron crags being forged there to help the gear forge. But this is really where, for a lack of a better term, the magic happens. This is where they're they're really built and given life is in this birthing crypt, which I just thought was such a cool concept. Because that, I mean, you're like, oh, what's going on in the crypt? So we'll see the body. But no, this is where where the gear forge are literally forged. This is where the, the, their life is given. So this is probably, if I was to to uh, you know describe it, this is the holiest place in Zobek. You know, this is probably the most revered spot in the entire city. Yeah, we've got Lada, we've got Prune, we've got Volan, we have all these others. But Zobek is the gear city, and this is the gear goddess, and this is definitely the place. Yeah, I agree. It, it's, it's a great opportunity if you have a gear forged in your par party uh, to put possibly reenact the transfer of your PC soul from their uh, humanoid body to uh, their uh, gear forge body, man, I, I I I could just imagine you know role playing a scene there uh, with with that oh, happening. Yeah. yeah, that's just super cool. Would be cool, you know. Our Cobalt Press comes out with a lot of neat little PDFs and stuff like that in their store. It would be really cool to get a PDF that really described the entire process of creating a gear forge, from the materials that go into it to the rituals around it. And like have like a a pamphlet on how to make a gear forged. I think that would be a really, or at least a blog post, right? Something like that. I would love to read and get the details on, um, because it's just something that I think would be a neat experience for the players to 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 be a part of, and maybe have to get parts or get certain materials, and then they can be part of that ceremony. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that would be super cool to to have yeah. for sure. We got one more temple. Joe, take it away. Yeah, so this is the Temple of Volin. The Temple of Volin is this majestic piece of Dwarven masonry on the outside. You see these fine statues show forges, hammers, horses, dwarves, and uh, battle array, and humans and dwarves in prayer by the forge fire. So obviously Vol Voland is, you know, this this mostly dwarven but human human god as well uh but a, a forge god you know it's all about creation uh inside the temple is this vast forge that runs 24 hours a day keeping volan's fires burning and the temple interior warm and smelling of you know just that that coal fuel and sweat uh the temple walls uh dampen the sound of the hammering so not to disturb like the priest and the neighbors but it, it's a constant rhythm of the hammers. The sound effect I actually use in the Temple of Volan is I went over to my World of Warcraft soundtracks and grabbed, what was it, uh, the, the Dwarven Center or the Dwarven City in, in World of Warcraft. But it always had that hammering sound. And I, that's the soundtrack I used when we went to the Temple of Volan. You just had that constant rhythming hammer. Um, and, and that's the perfect description of it. The temple really maintains a stable in town as well. So there's horses that are actually blessed by Volan, or at least supposedly blessed by, uh, blessed by Volan. The priests there, it's funny because they're really into horses. And so they do horse uh, trading, shoeing, animal care. There's uh, a yellow uh, russet blaze in some breeds of uh, draft horse called the Mark of Volan. And it's highly prized. So... Yeah, they're 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 into their whole their horses and their horse trade. So we mentioned the, the Temple of Rava, uh, oddly Fire Drake, and he's the high priest, and you know he he'll work the forge himself. He'll create 
uh, novices, iron holy symbols. They'll fulfill commissions for devout warriors or travelers and stuff like that. So you'll find him at both temples. And uh, I, I kind of picture him as someone who really enjoys his craft work. You know, yeah, he's doing these things, these commission stuff uh, at the Temple of Volan, but I kind of feel like his real passion is forging the 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 bodies and the armor and the gears for the gear forge themselves. Um, so that's why he he kind of works perfectly for both because he you know he's uh, he's definitely uh, a like probably I mean I feel like the forge cleric like there there's a a, a forge domain nowadays. Uh, that'd be a great domain for him because I don't think they really tell us specifically what his domain is, but that would be the perfect, you know, uh, cleric domain for him. Uh, but definitely a cool temple to check out and visit. I definitely think it's one worth uh, worth going to and seeing. Um, you had mentioned going to Perun for weapon repairs and stuff like that. I feel like, you know, Temple of Voland, you could probably get some of the same uh, there. You could probably get some nice crafted, you know, dwarven crafted weapons there and things like that. So, uh, definitely a cool place to check out. And, uh, I, uh, they said we went there once, um, and it was, you know, just to, uh, they, they wanted to check it out. They were just like, Oh, what's this temple? And they decided to walk in. So I was completely unprepared for it, but I had my soundtrack and I pulled it up and threw it on and did my best to get them through there. And they kind of checked it out and, you know, made notice some stuff and, uh, interacted a little bit, but, um, I'm sure they're going to be back in there at some point. Yeah, in hindsight, I, I should have used the Temple of Olin for weapon repair and, and stuff like that. Um, it, it is it is a great place, and I, and I do like the idea where uh, Andli is is a craftsman that uh, will work on all parts of creating a gear forged body and participate in the ceremony of transferring the soul. So, you know, I like mm-hmm. that. I like that idea a lot of, of him being a forged uh, cleric, having more fulfillment in the uh, craftsmanship of, of a gear forge uh, body uh, rather than the, yeah. uh, the duties of a high priest. Yeah, no, it makes sense, right? He it, it just, I, I guess I feel like he's a dwarf that really enjoys his craft. <laughs> yeah. Like a lot. All right. Well, we have one more district uh, to talk about, and it's a small one. It's a small section of lush green ground on the northern side of the River Argent, and it's reserved for the shepherds to keep their flocks, cowherds to ready cattle for their slaughter, and the hostlers to graze the horses of the wealthy. The fields are also the site of the annual spring trade fair, where all of the far-flung partners of Zobek's merchant houses bring their very best wares uh, to begin the trading season. Kariv horse traders in their caravans the dark-skinned merchants of Siwal and Harakesh, the flying city of Sakim, dwarven clans from the Iron Crags, and traders dealing in the pale amber and fine wood of Morgau and Doresh all gather for two weeks of often frenzied business on the green pasture land. During the autumn and winter months, the pastures commonly host some herds of Rotharian centaurs. Their tents stay until the first blossoms appear in the spring, when they return to their wanderings. In the high summer, the pasture is used for haying and boarding houses for horses of the Zobek Hussars, who often perform maneuvers here. Experts with lance and sword, they patrol the roads that carry goods to the crossroad city. Most people are quite happy to give them prime pasturage for part of the year. So not a super exciting uh, district, but the uh, the fair that they have for two weeks, that to me is ripe for some storytelling. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, the other thing too, don't forget is the pastures is on the north side of Zobek, right? And if we're looking at the Zobek map that Cobalt Press provides, it's on the right side of the map because north is to the right on that map. So, but that's the great northern road that leads out and, and then coming in through that gate and then through the pastures and across the river, across Puffing Bridge. So it's a very popular route. And the pastures might be the very first thing your players see when they first enter Zobek. So, you know, depending on what time of year uh, they go in, this could be the first thing you're describing to them as they pass, you know, through the, the outer gates of Zobek, through the wall. They, you know, are they're met by this 
almost farmland, these pastures, horses and cows grazing. You might see some knights practicing on lands, things like that. So be ready to kind of describe this area to your players because it's definitely going to, it's going to be the first thing they see when they kind of enter Zobek before they enter Zobek proper uh, and then cross Puffing Bridge. So this is probably one of the most common entrances to Zobek. Um, so they, they will experience it. And yeah, there's a fair there. Uh, I also kind of thought about, you know, smaller carnivals or troops, maybe setting up a tent out there. Uh, so if you're, if you want to kind of have them go to a show or something like that, uh, that might be an area where, you know, it's going to happen. The circus comes to town. They're probably going to set up out there. I kind of see those fields as like fairgrounds as well, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. For smaller events. Yeah, there's that big fair. Uh, the spring trade fair, but I can see smaller little carnivals and things like that coming through town and stuff like that kind of happening out there. It's kind of a, maybe not the most important area in Zobac, but one that you might actually get some use out of, which yeah, is kind of cool. Sure. And, you know, it's, there's two walls, right? Because there's an outer wall that surrounds it. And then there's another wall across the river. So it, it's, it is a still a defended area and, and allows for like, if there was an attack through that, the North gate, they could put Mount Calvary out there to kind of fight first. And then if they needed to fall back across Puffing Bridge and defend the inner city wall. So uh, it is it is a defensible area for sure. Yeah. And now one thing to keep in mind about Zobek. Zobek is just not the city itself, but it's the surrounding area, you know, that's called the Crosswords. And there are right. a lot of uh, super cool locations, you know, just outside there. The first one is Castle Rumaur. It is a well-garrisoned castle east of the city that overlooks the last pass into the river valley and the southern vineyards toward the Madgar kingdom and the plains of the Rotharian centaurs. It is primarily known for its hussars, though its commander is invariably from the Order of the Griffin Knights. So this is kind of a place where you can go to um, get some training, you know, from the uh, Hussar Knights, you know, on a particular weapon or um, uh, have a mystery adventure there. It's a super old castle. It goes all the way back to uh, the Strauss days. So there's a great opportunity uh, to uh, utilize a separate location and kind of bring your own uh, flavor to that. But Joe, your favorite place is coming up. Yes. So speaking of castles going back to the Strauss days, there's none more infamous than Castle Shadowcrag itself. So we talked a bit about this in the very first episode of that Midgard show. Or no, sorry, the very second episode of that Midgard show when we first got into Zobek. Because this was once home of House Strauss. And at the time it was called Castle Strauss. And it's this black stone rune and it, it's lightly inhabited by uh, dower dwarves and a few human holdouts. Uh, the village below burned at the same time the night Zobax rebels hung the men and women and even the children of House Strauss from the battlements. So ever since, the place has had this kind of evil reputation. Uh, the castle sits about a day's ride north of Oros Bridge, and uh, the Free Army maintained a presence here for a few years, but abandoned it as an unexplained casualties kind of mounted. Um, most consider the ruins haunted uh, by Fae and uh, by a few dark memories. And this can be explored in the actual Castle Shadowcrag adventure for both 5e and there's one for Pathfinder as well. Uh, hard to find that adventure because it's only available in print. Um, at least the 5e version is only available in print, uh, which I was fortunate enough to get my hands on. It is a very cool and creepy place. I would say uh, it's not the place you want to send your players before tier two or even tier three. <laughs> like level 10-ish is about right, 10-11, uh, for, for at least for the Castle Shadowcrag adventure. Very, uh, and it is, it's a haunted place. It has a connection to the Shadow Fae and, and the, the Realm of Shadows. This is really where Zobek got its start. So it is a cool old ruins and a very neat place to go check out uh, if you so dare. Yeah, uh, but you know, do so with caution. Yeah, and and the write up in in this book kind of undersells it. You know, there's also a vampire that lives there. You know, some ghosts and and so forth. But Joe, you're right. Return to Castle Shadowcrag is a must run uh, adventure. It allows your players to relive the uh, days of the Strauss and the Great Revolt. 
And it's a and it's a yeah. great way to impart the history of Zobek on your players without a big long readout uh, uh, of of lore in your your session. Yeah, I, I I'm dying to get to play. Uh, you and I were talking before the recording today, and I even said how I'm uh, kind of looking forward to uh, getting to run that at some point for my players because it is uh, it is a cool one. Yeah, yeah. The last area that we're going to talk about that's nearby to Zobeg and part of the uh, Crossroad region is the Margrave Forest and the Griffin Towers. Uh, this was the private property of House Strauss uh, back in, in the days. And the Margrave Forest retains a certain hushed atmosphere of wild de decay and noble privilege. This is your proverbial uh, haunted forest, so to speak, you know, where grim fail ta tales uh, took place. Uh, travelers go quietly through the deepest woods, uh, seeking to avo avoid throat-slitting bandits, howling direwolves, and even kobolds bitterly defending their secret vines. And at the same time, there are the untamed regions of the Margrave call to Zobecker's lust for wealth because the forest provides the timber that builds its barges, fuels its smithies, and uh, braces its silver mine. You know, you can hear in the background the noise of cobalt miners, timber cutters, and merchants rumbling along the Great Northern Road uh, that uh, grows each year. So, you know, you can really play up an idea of deforestation for uh, commerce purposes. You can, uh, you know, play up the uh, hauntedness of it. Uh, there's a number of adventures that uh, take place in the Margrave. There's even a whole uh, book, you know, Tales from the Margrave, uh, that has, I believe it's like a dozen super awesome adventures. I've played every yeah. single one of them yeah. and uh, love it. Yeah, I mean, the Margrave is its own campaign. So like, we've we've covered Zobek as almost like its own individual campaign. So like, you can run zobak forever margrave is the same way it's it literally it has like just like zobak has its own book margrave has its own book it's its own little mini campaign setting the margrave definitely has a bit of a fanghorn forest feel to it as well it, it's it's alive we talked i believe in our very first episode when we first started the, the show we talked about reputation of being a thing in uh we've talked about it a few other times but reputation being a thing in a midgard in the cobalt press uh material and there is Margrave has its own reputation that you can do. Um, so you will start off with a base reputation there. And depending on your actions there, uh, the forest will be friendly or not friendly towards you. There is an intelligence to that forest. There is something it's old. It's ancient beyond ancient. It is a, a, a very strange place. Unlike Fanghorn, there are settlements in the forest and there are places that people live in the forest, but it is, it's, it's got a personality. I don't know how else to put it into words. The thing, the the life, the creepiness that is the Margrave. It is a, such a cool place. And I know the first time I ever went on an adventure in the Margrave, I was scared. <laughs> I was like, what is going on here? It is it is an intimidating place because it's like you even if you're like there to do good, you're worried that you're gonna step on a twig and piss it off. Um, you just don't know. It's it's almost unpredictable, right? Yeah, yeah. And the Great Northern Road is uh, a very important to the uh, commerce of, of the region. Um, it is heavily yeah. traveled during the uh, warm periods of the year. Um, winter is the only time where it's not traveled and quiet uh, returns uh, to the forest. Uh, but this is the main road from Zobek to Morgau and Doresh, uh, the Bimian Majocracy also down to the banks yeah. of, of the Argent River itself. And the road yeah. is, is really half of the income of uh, Zobek, you know, along with the other half, you know, being the river itself. But uh, right. as you travel, you'll see these uh, towers, you know, these square towers that uh, mm. that appear at in intervals. And uh, and those are the uh, Griffin Towers. Yeah, the Griffin Towers are are kind of a bastion of the Strauss days as well. Uh, you know, we talk about the Griffin Riders of Zobek. The Strauss family had its own Griffin Riders, but after the fall of the Strauss family, these got less and less use. And now, for the most part, they're not really used at all anymore. A lot of the old Griffins and stuff like that are now wild to the Margrave. There's two different types, uh, some of which are 
quite fierce and not overly friendly, others of which can be tamed. And those are the, similar to the ones that the Zobak Griffin Riders use. I think the Zobak Griffin Riders tried to maintain them for a while, but as their numbers dwindled, they just couldn't anymore. So I think there's eight along the Northern Road and then a few more scattered throughout the forest and stuff like that. Um, but they are they are still there. They can be used for different things. I, you know, I, I picture griffins maybe still using them to roost there and lay their eggs. Uh, it could be a, kind of like a, a weather top kind of scenario where you might try to stay there for the night and find shelter. I could see them being haunted, perhaps. Uh, I don't know if there's any adventures specifically that uh, that Cola Press has produced that you go to those uh, towers or not. But I, feel, I see I, I see a, like a lot of use for them. Um, it seems like they're there's a lot of potential there, right? Yeah, from from the lore, the eastern Griffin Tower that overlooks the plains is still occupied by the Griffin Riders. There is an adventure in uh, the Tales from the Margrave called Gall of the Spider Crone, which takes place in a uh, Griffin Tower that's been converted into an inn. And yes. that adventure is is just wonderful. I'll have to check that one out. I remember that one. As soon as you said, I was like, oh, yeah, I have not played it. I, I briefly glanced over, but that one does sound like a cool one, you know? And then the Northern road itself is like you said, it's a major trade route. And uh, just to kind of tie back to something we talked about a long time ago, the Oros bridge is on the great Northern road. And I remember I think when we talked about the, the, the revolt, there was a battle at Oros bridge, right? And it was where they kind of made their stand. It was, it was a, this great battle there and it really turned the tide of the war uh, with the Strauss family. And I remember we weren't quite sure where Oros Bridge was, and I finally figured it out that it was actually along the Northern Road. And if you look at the Midgard map, you can see the Northern Road actually comes out the eastern side of Zobek, kind of dips down and then up, and it crosses the river. And right there, that's where the Oros Bridge is, is where it crosses the Argent River on the Great Northern Road. So, um, you know, not much of a, uh, uh, I guess, a, a use for it in game other than point of interest. <laughs> <laughs> historical fact, a great battle happened here. But I mean, sure, maybe there's some ghosts or something that haunt that bridge from that battle. But that is along the, the, the Great Northern Road. So the Northern Road in general is an important route. And uh, you know, a lot of trade, a lot of stuff could happen along there. A lot of cool little one shots, a lot of stuff with bandits. Who's our goblin friend? Dib. Dib can show up there. From uh, from uh, the first uh, prepared, um, not the Wagon of Doom, but the Fortress. Can, perfect spot right along the Northern Road, man. Dip could set up shop right along the Northern Road in his overturned cart. I mean, cool stuff could happen there. Yeah, yeah. So a lot to do in the, in the Margrave as well. But uh, like I said, uh, yeah. Joe and I will do probably a few episodes on the Margrave Forest uh, in, in the future. Explore it yourself. You know, there's a lot of great lore. And again... It's your proverbial Black Forest, uh, home of Grimm's fairy tales. That is a place where you can take your uh, players and, and have some fun with them, for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Definitely. Gonna, Margrave was going to get some, some episodes, <laughs> more than one. Sure. Because it's a big place, and there's a lot to do there. Yeah. So that's our show. I hope you enjoyed it. Joe, how can people reach you? Yeah, uh, you guys can always find me on uh, Twitter at... Uh, toolbox underscore GM. And of course, I have my YouTube channel, which is GM Toolbox. I'm um, also on like TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and all those at GM Toolbox as well. And I'm always on the Midgard Adventures Discord server at GM Toolbox there. Uh, how about you, Clay? How can they reach you? Yeah, you can reach me on Midgard Adventures Discord server at, uh, at Clayton Thompson. And that's Thompson without a P. Uh, this is a great place uh, to uh, get to know Midgard, interact with uh, other fans of Midgard. Uh, we're independent. It's a fan-based cooperative group that is affiliated with Cobalt Press. So there you'll find all kinds of stuff about Midgard lore, other community members sharing their tips and tricks, answering your questions. And uh, we also offer organized play games, both online and IRL in a few locations around the United States. Our community is open to everyone, particularly those new to Midgard and role-playing games. So if you want to get to know Mi uh, Midgard better, Two places to do it, Midgard Adventures Discord server and the Cobalt Press official Discord server. So uh, those are two great locations to do that. Um, we also have a dedicated channel for that Midgard show on the server where you can post comments and talk about the content of the show. You can also put it down in the comments below. We will answer your uh, comments. And we'd love to hear uh, some ideas from you 
as to uh, where we should go next. You know, what areas of uh, Midgard uh, interest you? And uh, then we can, you know, plan out the uh, next series of our episodes as well. So uh, there's an invitation to the server uh, down below as well. Check us out. But most importantly, spread the word about That Midgard Show. Help us grow. Yep. And don't forget, we also have a uh, That Midgard Show uh, Twitter. So check us out there. Make sure you're following us. And, you know, if you like the show, make sure you click the like button, subscribe to our channel, spread the word about That Midgard Show. Uh, we're on all the major podcast platforms. So please subscribe there. Leave us a positive comment or a five-star review, whatever you can do to help. But like I said, just we really appreciate everybody's feedback on the show. We're having a great time doing it, and we, we really appreciate our community. So thank you for all that. So that's it for today, guys. And remember, as Wolfgang Barr says, strip it for parts and make it your own. Thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone. <laughs>